Good afternoon, dear colleagues. The session that was adjourned on the 17th of February 2022 is now reopened. How does lobbying impact our food and agricultural policies? Lobbying is often considered the sole remit of large companies and firms, but it also has the potential to directly influence our health, what is on our plates, and what we see in our supermarket aisles. Here's how lobbying works to shape agricultural policy and influence both regional and national food environments, for better or worse. How does lobbying work? At its core, lobbying is when an individual or a collective shares their opinions on an issue with government officials with an aim to influence policy. Conventional lobbying involves companies engaging professional lobbying firms to execute lobby campaigns. But as lobbying practices have evolved to technology and the diversification of lobbying channels, the scope of what it means to lobby has widened. It is now common for nonprofits, industry groups, and companies to directly launch lobbying campaigns. The means of lobbying ranges widely, from more traditional approaches, such as directly engaging with politicians, to funding academic papers that support a policy stance or shaping public perception through social media campaigns. Modern lobbyists usually adopt a combination of these approaches. Here are a few of the common approaches used to lobby. Industry-funded research. Industry-funded research has historically been a primary way for companies with vested interests to indirectly influence policy and public perception. Many reports show that industry-funded papers have a high risk of bias, from the agenda-setting stage to the design and publication of the research. Studies of food industry research also found that funded reports are often associated with a selective reporting of results that favor the funder. A prime example of this was seen in 2016, when a journal article revealed that the U.S. sugar industry funded research that downplayed the relationship between sugar and coronary heart disease in the 1960s and 1970s. The Funded Literature Review examined multiple causes of coronary heart disease and concluded the best way to address the disease is to cut out fat in American diets. Social media campaigns. Digital technology has gifted food lobbyists another powerful tool to influence public opinion. Social media campaigns have become a key manner for companies to shape, inform, and sometimes misinform public perception in favor of their message. A study published by the University of London looking at how the Australian ultra-processed food industry used social media to influence policy found that some of the main tactics used include co-opting public health narratives, supporting self-regulation, engaging in policy processes, and affecting public perception. In one example given in the article, Australia's Beverage Council responded to a Twitter comment stating, Discriminatory taxes, like a soft drink tax, have had no discernible impact on public health anywhere in the world. What do food and beverage companies lobby about? In 2020, food and beverage companies spent a collective $38.2 million on lobbying, and they will lobby about any issue that will affect their business. Professor Marion Nestle, former professor of nutrition, food studies, and public health at NYU, says, I can't think of a single area of food or nutrition policy that isn't subjected to lobbying. How a lobby campaign is initiated The lobbying process will look different depending on the initiators, the channel used, and the country the lobbying occurs in. Despite this, it is generally agreed that the most effective period to lobby is during the initial agenda-setting stage. Here's a brief summary of how a lobby campaign can be initiated by an advocacy group in the EU. First, the lobbying issue is identified. Second, advocacy group consults member organizations on the issue and develops a position that best represents the majority view. Third, the advocacy group gathers data and produces briefings and reports to support their stance and shares documents with member organizations. Fourth, Members of the advocacy group will submit document to local government ministers. Fifth, the advocacy group may also submit a joint letter to the EU Commission on behalf of all members. And finally, the actions following the initial lobbying depend on whether the advocacy group's recommendations have been adopted. How lobbying is influencing modern food and agricultural policy Lobbying continues to shape modern food and agricultural policy in potent ways. Lobbying may even occur at a state level, as shown by Brazil and Argentina's actions before COP26 in Glasgow. Leaked documents revealed that the countries, 
two of the biggest producers of beef and animal feed crops in the world, lobbied for the UN to downplay the relationship between meat consumption and global emissions. According to the BBC, both countries requested the authors of a UN report to alter parts of it linking plant-based diets to a reduction in global carbon emissions. Most recently, EU's agri-food lobbies have been lobbying against the EU's farm-to-fork strategy, with an overall goal to make food in Europe healthier and more sustainable. Objectives of the farm-to-fork strategy include halving the use of pesticides and antibiotics in livestock farming and reducing the use of fertilizer by 20%. Agri-food lobbies, such as CropLife Europe, have actively lobbied to weaken the strategy. Some have even leveraged the threat to food insecurity caused by the Ukrainian war to further roll back the strategy. Lobbying for the right reasons While lobbying is often associated with companies looking to shape policy or opinion out of self-interest, in the right hands, lobbying can also serve as a powerful means to improve our food systems. Eurogroup for Animals is a non-profit advocacy group that has worked with its members to improve animal welfare since its launch in 1980. Eurogroup has launched many successful lobby campaigns both independently and via the European Citizens' Initiatives. The European Citizens' Initiative was launched by the European Union so that citizens can directly participate in the policy-making process. If a citizen-led proposal reaches 1 million signatures, the European Commission will act on the issue. Citizen representatives will be able to meet with a European Commission representative to discuss the issue and will have a chance to present it to the EU Parliament at a public hearing. The power of this process was utilized in 2018, when End the Cage Age, as part of ECI, launched in September 2018 by Compassion and World Farming one of Eurogroup's members. The campaign sought to end caged animal farming in Europe. It closed a year later after successfully gaining 1.7 million signatures. And the Cage Age was the first successful European citizens' initiatives on the issue of farmed animal welfare. In June 2021, the European Commission committed to revise current legislation and put forward a proposal by the end of 2023 to phase out and prohibit the use of cages for hens, sows, calves, rabbits, and other farmed animals by 2027. Another example of a successful European citizens' initiative is the recent Save the Bees and Farmers, initiated by a network of over 140 environmental NGOs, farmer, and beekeeper organizations. Collectively, the members are demanding for an EU that is environmentally friendly, free of synthetic pesticides, and respects biodiversity and farmers. The European Citizens' Initiative ended after receiving 1.2 million signatures and has been submitted to the European Commission. Is lobbying regulated? Lobbying is a democratic, legal activity that can help politicians gain insights about key issues impacting citizens and organizations. However, the practice can also lead to unfair advantages for parties with more resources to invest in lobbying activities. Camilla Bjorkbom, political advisor for food policy at Eurogroup for Animals, comments, The corporates with business interests have a lot more money to spend they can sway away politicians. This is not regulated. It's not always a level playing field. More transparency is needed. Lobbying can also put public interest at risk when it happens behind closed doors. For example, U.S. lawyer Miriam Guggenheim is described in the U.S. National Law Review as a representative who assists a broad range of major food and dietary supplements companies in achieving their marketing goals while minimizing regulatory and litigation risks. Despite working with companies such as Mars on lobbying activities in 2011, Guggenheim has not been registered as a lobbyist since 2010. Guggenheim's case serves as an example of the ways in which lobbying has and likely continues to occur without full public transparency outside regulatory frameworks. Most countries have mandatory or voluntary systems in place to regulate lobbying practices. In fact, almost 90% of jurisdictions require lobbyists to be registered on a public registrar. In 2011, the EU set up the Transparency Register, a public database that records activities of interest groups trying to influence EU decision-making. Countries such as the US and Canada also have mandatory legislation requiring lobbyists to report annually on client spending. However, such regulation has been criticized as insufficient, with a US report finding that those registered to lobby disclose minimal information about their activities. There are also many independent organizations such as Corporate Observatory Europe and the U.S.'s Open Secrets, which work to increase lobbying transparency by providing data about lobbyists and their sources of funding. 
In order to provide equal access to lobbying, initiatives such as Brussels-based The Good Lobby assist citizens and nonprofits with lobbying skills and activities. The Good Lobby aims to increase citizen-driven lobbying by advising nonprofits on how to make their case at an EU level. Can lobbying be democratized? Since companies with vested interests usually have more financial resources to allocate to lobbying, can citizens actually make their voices heard? Lawrence Madrego, from The Good Lobby, expresses, The EU is actually a very open institution. They actively encourage citizens and civil society organizations to be part of the legislative process, especially because they were previously criticized as too opaque. When asked how to effectively lobby politicians, Björk Baum comments, Ultimately, civil society organizations and nonprofits represent the public interest. Businesses don't. Since politicians need to be elected, they are very open to adopting recommendations from public advocacy groups. Food and agricultural policy has undoubtedly been shaped by lobbying activity. Though not all food and agricultural lobbies have public interest at heart, the democratization of lobbying reflects the potential to positively influence public health through lobbying. Thank you very much for listening. This article is written by Claudia Lee and read by me, Ines Ortalanzo. Originally posted on Food Unfolded. Food Unfolded explores the stories behind the food on our plates, reconnecting us to the origins and sustainability of our food. Co-founded by the EU and powered by EIT Food.